You're listening to a podcast from The Word. So we're recording on Sunday morning. Last night, I went to bed at 8.30. How late did you stay up, Alex? I pushed the boat out and I was in bed with my vegan hot chocolate and water hottle bottle uh, at 9.15 p.m. <laughs> this, what is, this is a Saturday night we're talking about. Well, I'm the, I'm the, uh, the mad old stop out here. Go on. I, started, I started watching the Brits at half past eight. And, uh, and you, uh, you just got gripped, did and you? Got, you just... <laughs> Go on. And, and should have left a lot earlier, but eventually just ducked out at 10 o'clock. Can I just say the Brits is embarrassing? Is it? It's genuinely embarrassing. There was a t- It used to sort of stand for something. I know I'm going to sound like a real old person here, but A, it's aimed primarily at people under 20. None of them watch telly anyway, and they certainly aren't watching telly at 8.30 on a Saturday night. Secondly, it used to be it used to be hosted by one person. It was James Corden or it was Ben Elton or whatever. Whether you liked them or you didn't, they were kind of in control and it had some kind of footing and it had some gravitas. And it seemed to you seemed to know what it was about. There's no reason for the Brits at the, at the moment, and there's ne- it's never explained why it's taking place. The difference between that and the Baptists is absolutely amazing. Really, it makes it makes the 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 the, 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 the Brits makes it look like it's the music industry. The kids have taken over the TV for one night. She had three presenters, Roman Kemp, who's the son of Martin Kemp, and uh, Clara Ampho from Radio 1, and a girl from Love Island, who spent the entire time saying how iconic it was. There was a... a, a iconic. A, iconic Ic- was the word. How long will it be before someone says it's iconic? Do you remember a, Do you remember that episode of Frasier years ago where the three of them were Martin, um, Niles, and, uh, and, and Frasier sat there watching Antiques Roadshow? And every time somebody said veneer, they would all have a drink. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> They'd go, yeah. veneer, yes. Well, yeah. it ought to be the same with the word iconic on the Brits, didn't it? Iconic. Well, Everybody would have been drink. three sheets to the wind within <laughs> 10 minutes. Oh, <laughs> my God, it was unbelievable. It's a new it was amazing, a terrible note early on. The first people on were Joe Hamilton, who's one of the postmistresses uh, still waiting for compensation, and Monica Dolan, who played her in the in the ITV um, uh, uh, version of events. And they come on and they do this thing about how you know the postmasters uh, and mistresses still haven't been paid, and the government promised they would be paid, and government, are you listening, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you go from that two minutes later to to Roman Kemp trying to get Kylie Minogue to drink champagne out of a shoe. And you just think, this is just embarrassing mm. and awful and awkward, you know. But the, one of the things about it was that there was some stuff about it the last few days, actually, on social media about the fact that there weren't any bands. The best band category had virtually no bands in it. I thought that was an interesting point, actually, as to what had happened to bands. Is there still an appetite for bands? Are there as many bands? Is it more difficult to be in a band? Do, do people want to be in bands? I don't know. What do you think? Really. What do you think, Alex? You are in a band from time to time. Sometimes what do you time. think? Have yeah. you noticed whether people are keen on it or not? Well, I have a theory, half baked the way it may be, that bands came about like so many other things in in history, quite accidentally at a time when they were absolutely pr- needed for practical reasons. People needed connection, and they needed resources. And we live in an era now where both of those things are in plentiful supply instantaneously to anybody. So, you know, um, I think the impetus for a lot of bands forming back in the day was to to find like-minded souls and form a gang and just kind of feel like you were part of something, which is when you're a teenager, it's really, really important. Um, you know, part of your social fabric and everything's, taken online now and when all your friends or all your mates are on Fortnite or snapchat or facebook or instagram or tiktok and you can see what they're up to all the time and you can communicate them yeah, that's you true, want, actually. there's no point and, and also you're making friends with people who aren't your friends from across the world because that's how social media works you know um so people find their tribe in a completely different way <clears throat> and also you know um i mean certainly when, when i was at school you needed someone to play bass you needed someone to be a singer because you couldn't do it you needed some to someone to record it you know um there was no other way there was no other way to to to, to be able to make music um aside from getting other people with skill sets you didn't have involved whereas now you've got logic everybody's got a studio at home and yeah. everybody seems to be a bit of a polymath as well i think kids are growing up you know with a with a lot wider skill sets than than anybody ever has and you know the, the need to form a band it, it, it's just not necessary anymore why would you because it, all the, it's hard work that's the thing it is because also and you're managing you're managing the personalities of <laughs> of five other kids 
you know, and kids' personalities are hard to manage anyway, you know. Do you, do you ever hear, Alex, you won't know this because you're way too young, but they used Tony Hancock, the British comedian, one of his legendary uh, programs, uh, used to be used to be called the Sunday Afternoon at Home. Do you remember that, Mark? The Tony yeah, Hancock. I do. And basically, it was Tony Hancock and Bill Kerr and Sid Jones and Hattie Jake sitting around in their, in their sort of flat in East Cheam on a Sunday afternoon in the late fifties and the early sixties. And basically, the joke was in those days there was literally nothing to do. <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely nothing to do. The pubs were closed. There was nothing on the television. You know, the cinema might open, but it won't open until, until half past seven or whatever. And it's it's in the, against that background of nothing to do that the great British bands were invented. You know, they were kind of, they were conspiracies against the tedium of everyday life. You know, that if you wanted to form a group, it was really hard to do. So it, you know, imagine, you know, in those days, they, they'd have to take their instruments on buses across Liverpool or London or whatever to meet the rest of the band, you know, to get together and to rehearse and so forth. Nobody goes to that much trouble for anything any longer. They simply don't because... All the diversion in the world is available on your at the end of your fingertips, isn't it? You know, you don't need that. You don't need to go anywhere at all. And so, you know, bands used to be a way to one of the ways of dealing with that, you know, of putting something in your life that wasn't there before. Whereas people now have so much in their lives, or they or they feel that they have so much in their lives, so they they don't seem to feel the same urge to do it, you know. And, That's such a good point. That's well, really good. <laughs> and, and, I, go on. No, I'm just going to say that what picking up what Alex was saying about being part of those uh, yeah. WhatsApp groups. That's a really that's an interesting point too, and it's probably yeah. true. You know, I've got mates who've got kids who were in bands and they're now in fantasy football leagues on WhatsApp yes. or whatever. And actually, weirdly, that makes them feel connected with the same people that they were in the band with. And it may have replaced it. I can't believe it's totally replaced it because, you know, the fantasy when I was a, I don't know, a kid was, was kind of joining a gang like the Faces. You looked at the Faces and thought, I'd like to be in the Faces. If you were 15 in 1977, why wouldn't you want to be a member of Madness? Because, you know, being in a school group for me was something that gave you an immense amount of uh, identity and status, actually. But I guess those things just don't, just aren't there anymore. Well, and it, I guess there's no appetite for it. And the other things are, it must be so hard to find the rehearsal space mm-hmm. and there's no circuits like there were where you could go out and just play. And also I don't think there's an appetite among people to go out and, and pay money to go and see a group that they might never have heard of. Nobody takes a chance on things anymore. Do you well, think? The, big, but, the bigger pictures change as well, I think. You know, when, when I was growing up, the fantasy surrounding a band was, okay, we could join a band and perhaps if we're really good and we're really lucky, we could make lots of money. We could, we could, uh, we could spend time with lots of exciting girls and we could get lots of free booze. And, you know, now the paradigm's completely changed and everybody knows that being in a band is not a fast track to becoming a millionaire. The, the myth's been complete, the bubble's been completely popped, you know, so that end game isn't there. You know, hey guys, you want to join my band? We can be re- just, we, we can be remotely skinned and tour the UK together. It's, it's not very attractive, is it? You know. Actually, that's another thing is touring. But I think the great fantasy for the sounds reader in the late 70s was being on the road with yes. so-and-so band. Well, now everyone's been everywhere. You know, the idea that the Boomtown yes. Rats were in Paris, you think, well, Paris sounds exciting, and the Boomtown Rats. Everyone's been everywhere, so none of that's interesting. And nobody mm-hmm. travels anywhere anymore, nobody goes on the road. And it was being on the road in that band that was the exciting thing. You couldn't imagine sitting around just rehearsing or writing songs that was, that was part of the fantasy at all, and that doesn't exist. Um, you know, so when, when the Dave Clark Five went to the United States in 1964, just after the Beatles had come back from their triumphant visit there in February 1964, the Dave Clark Five went to America, and I think... I'm right in saying it was their first time out of the country. It was their first time on a plane. It was the first time they'd ever stayed in a hotel. Incredible. All that one night. Wow. 
And they went and did the Ed Sullivan show and in New York, a big success. And he said, can you stay and be here next week? And so they said, um, well, yeah, but we don't want to stay in New York. It's too cold. And so he flew them down to Montego Bay or somewhere like that. And then they came back the following week. But the point being, they hadn't been anywhere at all. The notion that that would happen nowadays, yeah. you know, that, that anybody would join a band and, uh, you well, know. That, that, well, you uh, might get to go to Miami. I've <laughs> been to Miami loads of times. It'd be £23 on EasyJet. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. it. I think, you know, Ryanair and EasyJet, they've kind of play their part in popping the bubble as well, because back in the day, people went on holiday to Wales in the summer. Yeah, so yeah. Anywhere, yes. beyond, anywhere beyond Barmouth was terribly exotic. <laughs> You know, now everybody's been to Malaga or Tenerife, you know. Um, and so, so tell me, I mean, this question of the circuit kind of interests me because obviously the number of venues shrinks all the time. I mean, I was reading only this morning in the Times that uh, I think 1,500 pubs closed in Britain last year. You know, I mean, it's, these play, the smoking ban, all these things have really affected these businesses were pretty marginal in the first place. But was there ever a time when there were loads of venues and people just went along because there was a band on? You know what I mean? Even though they did not a band with hits or anything like that, because that's what people talk about, you know, the the, the lack of, of interest in going to see bands that aren't people you've seen on television or whose records you you know. I mean, was there ever a time when there was that kind of circuit? Was it, Alex, in your memory? I mean, probably more than there is now, but I don't think... I think people have always been, to an extent, uh, wanting to be sure of what it is they're getting. Oh. You know, how strange is that? I know, right? <laughs> and so the prospect of taking a punt on a bunch of bunch of chances playing Mustang Sally, you know, it's it's not. It's if not, only, if only they were playing Mustang Sally, Alex. Alex uh, but if you you put it outside the pub and you know and in big letters, mm. band will play Mustang Sally. But you're not getting that with they're most not, of the they're, they're playing their own material. They're playing their own yeah. material <laughs> indeed with another unknown. Yeah. Which is a bit frightening. I, I used to work at a venue in High Wycombe when I was at uni. Uh, <laughs> it was um, it was the world's grimmest strip club in a day and a metal venue at night. Oh, um, lovely! Yeah, so it was it was quite quite a place. But we used to have bands on every night of the week, and um, after the every night, home, every night, every night, seven nights a week. In fact, the Kings of Leon played their first UK show there. I wasn't there, but there's there's an interview somewhere of them talking about it and being asked what their what the worst gig they've ever played in it was, and they were talking about this horrible hovel somewhere in the southeast of England that had um, uh, very depressed ladies taking their clothes off during the day. It was the White Horse and High Wycombe, recently closed, but we used to have bands on seven nights a week, and the venue was half full for one of them, probably. And this is. So do you think people have gone gone along knowing nothing about them? Just just think, I'll just I'll risk it. It's it's thirty five p whatever. No, I think all these bands pulled in their. Sometimes we had a well known band like Block Party come through who would who would sell out the venue. Who are clearly on their way up, but predominantly it would be you know it would be Ars Curtains you know or so or someone <laughs> or someone like that legendary Ars Curtains bringing along their mates from Aylesbury and Hemel Hempstead. And it, you know, and and the the success of the gig depended on how many mates the bands had and how how bothered they could be to make the trip out. I think it was just all to do with people's individual networks. Mm. And nobody was really taking a punt. Nobody was really that bothered because they were reading about all the bands they knew they liked in the enemy, and they go and see them. You know, yeah. and then, so. Um, but that issue about being the, there being any money in it, I think, is interesting because we kind of look back at a time when. Groups in the late 70s and early 80s were, were selling quite a lot of records, therefore they must have made some money. Well, no, no, they, I'm sure they didn't. A, that they were they were on record company advances which and, and probably left those um, record companies probably owing quite a lot of money. B, only the songwriter probably would have made a decent amount of money anyway. Did any member of the of the skids, apart from the people who wrote the songs, ever make a lot of... Do you remember when we interviewed um, Pauline Murray of Penetration? Yes. And she had a little... Um, in her book, she had a a, 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 a little a statement of the profit and loss of penetration oh, for Virgin over Records. two years. Wow. Yes. Virgin yeah. years. And I think I'm right in saying, was it, did they, over two years, did they either make or lose 600 quid? I can't remember. It was just nothing. It was absolutely nothing. By the time the expenses had come in, 
by the time everything that the record company wanted to charge them for, coming, there was nothing. And you kind of got the impression that Penetration were doing quite well. Well, they but had no, one hit, didn't they? So, no, people are complaining now, you're not going to make any money out of streaming. Well, no, of course, of course you don't. You get a 0. 0.005 pence per track or whatever. But I don't think that's any different from what it was back then. I can't imagine that many people made a decent amount of money if they didn't write the song. I don't think it is. And I'm not supposed to say this being a musician, but I do think there's a tendency among the musical fraternity to believe that because I've written songs and I play them, I'm entitled to a living from them. And it doesn't work like that. And I think it's, you know, it's 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 simplifying a very complex thing that, you know, um, that involves many powers that are beyond your control as a musician, i.e. society at large. And, you know, I don't think the, the streaming scenario, I think it equates to how it's always been, broadly speaking, but just in a different way. Well, you're not, you don't feel you're entitled to a living from them. You, you like them to be popular enough for you to make a living from them. But I don't, yeah. do you think you feel that people are, you know, does that guarantee me a career? I, I, I think some people are still sold in this myth that, you know, because because I am a troubadour or whatever, you know, I, I, I deserve to make a living from it automatically. You know, um, I'm entitled to be paid for all this time I put into writing this average song. There, there, there is that because people are, you know, artists are really, they, they're so sold in their vision a lot of the time. It's hard for them to see anything else. The other thing, the other factor that is um, come into play in the last 10, 10, 20 years is that of the money that people spend on music, um, and this will apply to both going to see live music and also streaming or downloading or whatever, a larger and larger proportion of it goes to a smaller and smaller proportion of the of their performance. And so... The more you pay to go and see Taylor Swift or whoever is the big the big thing, the less you're going to spend on anything else. Do you know what I mean? It's not passed around equally. You know, pe- people don't people don't think to themselves, "Well, I tell you what, instead of spending 150 pounds to go and see Taylor Swift, I'll go and see." 10 groups will cost me 15 pounds each. It doesn't work like that at all, does it? You know, because yeah, here's one of the fun, fundamental problems about, you know, people will always complain that the music business isn't fair. Well, of course it isn't fair. And the reason, for, there's a very good reason for that, because the public aren't fair. We're not fair. You know, the whole, the whole way that we consume these things is not fair at all. We, we only listen. think about ourselves. <laughs> right. yeah, but we listen to a small number of people endlessly because that's what we like yeah. rather than listening to a, a wider number of people a fewer times, you know, spreading it around. It doesn't work like that. You know what I mean? What drives people is it, it, it's a very, very small number of, of big names, you know, and so the whole notion of the music business ever being fair is just preposterous. It's got unfairness is built into its very into its very nature. And you can say exactly the same thing about the film business or the or the book business or whatever, you know. You know, transfer your, your complaints about the music business to the book business for a second, Alex. Yeah. What who who are the most successful authors in the UK? Are they the best at all thing? No. They're people famous on the television. It's as simple as that. And they'll come from all kinds of backgrounds. Yeah. And and that's what sells books. Being famous on the television doesn't mean that everybody who's famous on the television is going to do it, but it means that you're not going to do it unless you're famous on the television or you're J.K. Rowling. Yeah? So it's it's not fair anywhere you look. But I think people's expectations of what they what they want from a band have changed as well. As shows are getting more sophisticated, you know, Taylor's show is yeah. a really good example of that. Yeah. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I feel like successful bands now, they aren't really bands, they're concepts. And a band has to, you know, it's not enough to have four guys with shaggy hair and leather jackets. I mean, that's been done to death and it, and it clearly hasn't changed the world despite everybody's best efforts, yes. you know. Um, <laughs> And so, so that bubble's been popped as well. And I think that Wet Leg and The Last Dinner Party are two really good examples. Wet Leg's a concept, isn't it? It's a big in-joke. And you go knowing that you're going to be immersed in this in-joke for an hour and a half, and you're going to be happy with that, and you're going to leave, you know, having got what you wanted from Wet Leg. The Last Dinner Party, this gothic, gothic renaissance, medieval kind of um, sort of, yeah, I suppose, throwback in a way. But you know exactly what you're getting the production. You're getting the finely tuned, yeah, you fully are. formed, 
um, production. That, that, you get that's the story. It you get exactly. the story. A- it goes back to Robert Forster's book, Ten Rules of Rock and Roll, Ten Commandments of Rock and Roll, or whatever it's called, isn't it? That we've talked about in the past, that most band, bands have shown you everything they have to show you by the third number. You know, yeah. and, and there he's talking, and that's absolutely true. You know, all the all the information that is going to be vouchsafed has has already been transmitted by the third number. Whereas, you know, you go and see the last dinner party or whatever, the, the, there is a sense that there's a show there, isn't there? Absolutely. There's that's very true about the last dinner party. They're very much, a, 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 they're a kind of video concept and they're a, they're a photo opportunity concept. And they, they don't actually have a drummer. When they, when they play, they have to bring in somebody else. But that drummer isn't a member of the band because the right. band just looks like this particular picture. Yeah. So yeah. I think you're right, actually. It's kind of, and the songs are slightly fantasy, aren't they? Do you think also there's another thing going on under here that that for young blokes it's all over? <laughs> totally, because because young <laughs> blokes know. As I say, the, the primary reason why young blokes know now that joining a band isn't a isn't a fast track to to pulling loads of exciting young ladies in floor plint dresses. It's just not the, the, the sex appeal of being in a band is completely gone. It's not a, a sexy thing anymore. It's just not. Wow. Is it that is, interesting? That so is think, serious news. <laughs> that really, that's very interesting. So, because the old thing was, if you hung a, a, a guitar around your neck, it was a powerful aphrodisiac, supposedly, wasn't it? No, in no, the age. No, so, do you think that's so people don't? Do you mean you don't automatically fancy people on stage with? Yeah, you, now, you know? now having a guitar hung around your neck, neck insinuates that you may or may not be homeless. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> So many bubbles popping in this conversation. Yeah, but, but there's also there's also here's another one though that um, and Mark and I were talking about this the other day. You know that, that that you know a lot of what we're talking about here is 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 based on a thing that Will Hodgkinson wrote in the Times about why there are no bands. You know, to time with the Brits and so forth. And uh, there's a quotation there from a member of the Last Dinner Party and. Uh, not not a controversial quote at all, but people launched in on the on this person saying, "Oh, well, she went to this posh school or whatever," and um, and they were saying that you know the, the whole has social media just completely killed pop music, in the sense that nobody can say anything any longer, and a lot of what male bands used to say was, "We're blokes." We're look at us. We're out there. We're on the lash. You know, we're wild and crazy. We're we're raised by wolves. Look at us. We're really strange. You you can't say that anymore. You're not allowed that expression. No, it sounds predatory or threatening or Absolutely. you know. Yeah. And, and the only people, the only people who do it, I, I I realized this recently. You know that um, if you watch female comics as I do endless clips on YouTube shorts or whatever, what do all female comics talk about nearly all the time? Sex. What do all male comics never talk about ever? They can't. They sex. can't talk about sex. They simply can't. Absolutely it's cannot. absolutely flipped around. You know? Totally. And, uh, and so... A lot it's of, considered to be aggressive and uh, yes. impressive, isn't it? Uh, so, uh, so a lot of the kind of behaviours of an, I don't know, an oasis or, or whatever back in the day, you wouldn't be... You simply not allow those kind of behaviours in the public space anymore. And that was a lot of what rock bands did. A lot of what rock bands did was turn up in the enemy every week going, look at us, we're amazing. <laughs> we, just, we go too far. That's our whole yeah. thing, you know. Can't do it anymore. Yeah, so, all the things that they used to celebrate, the drinking, the smoking, the, yes. <laughs> the drugging, the, everything, it's just now absolute anathema, isn't it? You just can't do it. Yeah, it's just waiting for somebody to tut out it. At the yeah, end. it is. It so is. anyway, so bands, uh, it's all over. That probably means we're back next week. The Word Podcast. Prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. So I was talking to a gentleman of my acquaintance the other day, and and one of the things he does is he runs a kind of medieval fair down in Sussex every year where quite significant numbers of people come from come from for a few consecutive weekends. To, to sit in the green sward and uh, and uh, you know witness reconstructions of jousting contests or whatever and uh, you know probably drink mead and listen to medieval music and so forth 
And I was thinking to myself, Alex, you're missing a trick here because <laughs> I can well see Alex. I want you to imagine this, ladies and gentlemen. If Alex is, is kitted out in doublet and hose and he's equipped with a lute rather than his usual guitar and he just actually walks around the grounds of these, this medieval fair singing Beatles songs adapted for uh, for ancient times. I think there could be a real future in it, Alex. Have you? And, and I put this to you and I gave you the challenge of... Uh, of uh, recasting some Beatles favourites in the... I can really picture this. Uh, you, you can, you can yeah, see it, can you? So, like, Festy the Jester. <laughs> you know, uh, right. Possibly with a tricorn hat, you know. Absolutely. A little, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I was born to the do doubloons. it. The doubloons. I think it's going to be really popular. Well, so what would be your repertoire be, Alex, if you are going to do this? Well, I consulted my pal Richard Englert, who um, runs Autonomy Music Group, and he gave me a few good ones to kick me off. Uh, he's, he suggested From Mead to You. From Mead to You. Oh, yeah. good. That's good. Very good. Very yeah. good. I, I, <laughs> I saw her burning there. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, no, no. No, no, no. no, no. Let, let, let it bead. I let uh, it bead. Yeah, and she she came in through the privy window. <laughs> that's, that's, okay, a good one. No that's a good one. That's good. I've good. got I've got one here. Everybody's got something to hide except me and my kestrel. I've got a variation <laughs> on that. Actually. Go on. go. On. Well, shall I give you my list? I've got go on. A list yeah, go on. I went through them last night and I had a great time doing this. Okay, so I'm going to start. This is this is a bit dodgy. I'm I'm, I'm scraping the barrel here, but Anne Boleyn, go to him. Oh that's, right, that sort of works. So yeah. Get yeah. Okay, yeah. Get loose. Yeah, ba- baby, you're a rich surf. <laughs> yeah, uh, I put in chains because that just felt really self-explanatory. Yeah, yeah. Ride my horse. Can you guess what that one is? Was I drive my car? Yeah. Right, right. Uh, everybody's got something to hide except me and my monk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not as good as Kestrel, but it's good. Fixing a murder hole. Okay. Free as a baron. I don't want to spoil the jousting, Tawny. I want to chop off your hand. Oh, oh yeah. Lord. This is all, <laughs> if this I is all getting gruesome. It's getting too grisly. Okay. Is it? How about how about comely Rita? <laughs> Can uh, we, do we talk about from me to thou or something like that? Well, stage. I've got she esteems you. She esteems you. Oh, that's good. Comely Rita's very good. I've got I'm a happy to, just to joust with you. Just the oh, that's you. very good. <laughs> and one slightly older. Why do you? Why don't we do it in the woad? Oh, that's yeah. Um, oh, very good. So you know, if people have got, if people have got further ideas for for things of this nature, for you know, so we're looking for a set list for Alex in his new career. About when I'm, when as I'm, a wandering minstrel wearing doublet and hose, playing a lute. Um, you know, just wandering around entertaining the customers at a, at a, at a weekend uh, renaissance kind of recreation out in the country. I think, I think there's a great future. That's in very good. So, Mark, what were you saying about Patty Boyd and Eric Clapson's love letters? Have you, well, read, have you read these? No. The, well, yes, I have read some, actually, um, because they were uh, – they were printed, weren't they? I think it's interesting uh, because Patty Boyd is now selling a load of letters that Eric Clapton wrote her. And uh, the first thing you think is, was I, I went, obviously she must have got Eric Clapton's permission to do this. And indeed yeah. she had. And I thought it was a classic win-win situation, actually. Because it's, also... co- it's his copyright, isn't it? If yeah, it you is. Send, if you send a letter, it's your copyright. Yeah. Not the person it goes to. Yeah. Let that be a lesson to you, young Alex, if that ever <laughs> happens. Anyway, go on, carry on, Mark. No, I thought it was interesting. And also, I think that whole thing of the Clapton, Patty Boyd, George Harrison love triangle was massively overcooked, wasn't it? I mean, it was just one of those things that happened that, that we all wanted to believe that, you know, Clapton was a cad and that George had been cruelly cuckolded, you know. But that wasn't the case at all, if you look at it. I mean, it all it's very complicated because Charlotte Martin was Clapton's girlfriend. And then I think after she split up with Clapton, went off with, with George Page? Harrison. I don't know. Oh, she married Jimmy Page. Yeah. <laughs> God, yes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but she went off with George Harrison in January 1969. So there's a bit in the early part of Get 
back the movie. I think it's around the 6th or 7th of January when he comes in looking a bit ashen-faced, and like he's had a bit of a tough time. Well, the truth is he's been booted out of the home by Patty Harrison, so mm-hmm. all that's going on. And that actually Patty and George was obviously having a difficult time for quite a long time, was clearly over when George Har- when uh, Clapton and she got together. Also, they're quite interesting, that family, aren't they? Because you've got uh, there's Patty Boyd and then there's Paula Boyd, who also went out with Clapton, the sister, and Jenny Boyd, and Jenny Boyd. went out with Donovan and Fleetwood Mac. So yeah. very amazing family, really. But I think that whole love triangle thing was massively overcooked. But I just thought it was an interesting story because if you look at the letters, you, um, Clapton comes out of it as terribly sensitive and romantic and poetic and lovelorn. And, uh, and so he... he he he's re- reflected very well by the sale of these letters, or will be. And, of course, she's going to make a big pile of dosh. So mm-hmm. it's a very happy situation. Win-win. I suppose so. I suppose so. Do people still write love letters, Alex? Why am I looking at you? I, I don't think they do. I think they send racy texts. Racy texts? Yeah. It's not, it's not quite the same, is it? No, they're not, no, not they're, really. They're not going to come up at Sotheby's in 40 years. <laughs> oh, no, no. Racy texts sent between, uh, you know. Patsy Kensit and um, Liam Gallagher. Gallagher. Right. It's just not going to happen. Well, that that was pretext, pretext in those days, wasn't it? So yeah, we had talking of uh, the Boyds. We had Jenny Boyd, didn't we? As one of we our did. Guests. She was terrific. After, she was fantastic. It was really, really. She good. was really good. I, I I tell you something, listeners. Something that um, I'll, be, I'll be quite candid about this. I'll I'll let you in on a bit of a secret. Whenever we do these uh, word of your ear chats or videos or whatever, with people who are senior, we always come off afterwards and we have a chat. So, actually, she was really good, wasn't she? Because there's always your fear is that people won't remember anything at all. She was fantastic. She was wasn't fantastic. She? she was really good. And this week we did. That's the Susie Ronson. Uh, Susie Ronson. She was really good. That's he was out, really good. March the 11th. Was really good. This is Mick Ronson's wife. And she's written a fantastic book, me and Mr. Jones, about being David Bowie's. Uh, Stylist and hairdresser and costumier. She was just really sharp and she's such terribly a good memory. Terribly as good. As was Steve Howe. As Steve was Howe. Steve Howe. That's what I was going to say because we, we achieved a bit of a lifetime ambition the other day is to speak to Steve Howe out of Yes because I still have very fond memories going to see Yes at the LSE in, in, the, in the spring of 1971. And, my, and Mark, you saw them in, in where was I it? I saw them October 71, Southampton. Southampton Guildhall, yeah. And he was uh, so touched because we started off by saying, we saw you when you were touring 54, was it 53 years ago? I held up my old copy of Fragile. He was really, really touched, wasn't he? He was Amazing. terribly good, terribly good all the way through. And uh, and we said, well, you know, when we saw you, you were the new boy who just joined Yes. And now you're the kind of oldest member, to borrow an expression from P.G. Woodhouse's golfing stories. So... Steve Howe actually had a list somebody had sent him of, of what is it, Mark? I think you've got it there. Of the I got it from yeah, the oldest musicians still, go on. still touring, recording, and kicking. <laughs> Should I read some out? I mean, I can read go them on. this. It's really interesting. Willie Nelson's at the top, 90. 90. He's going on tour this summer with young whippersnapper Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan, 82, and uh, 82. <laughs> John Cougar <Malik. laughs> Amazing. John Mayle, 90. Frankie Valley, 89. Herb Albert is 88, Buddy Guy 87, Ringo Starr 83. So it does seem quite old now, 83, doesn't it? Tom Jones 83, Dionne Warwick, uh, Dion Warwick 83, Smokey Robinson 83, Bob Dylan, we done. Uh, John McLaughlin's 82, Paul Simon 82. He's still retiring, isn't he? Paul Simon. Well, out he it. still does interviews and so forth. I don't know yeah, yeah. performing live. Anyway, go and carry on. Yeah, Andy Summers 81. That's interesting, isn't Andy it? Andy Summers is Andy 81. Andy Summers. Andy Summers, could that be right? Yes. It could be right. Because Andy Summers was a member of Zoot Money's Big Roll Band in, like, 1966. So, yes, it's perfectly possible. I'm just going to quickly really Google makes Andy think. Summers was, I think, I think he was older than various members of the Beatles, wasn't he? Yeah, here we are. Born 31st of December, 1942. So that makes him older than George Harrison. Isn't that amazing? Oh, that is extraordinary. Another time, you know, when the police were really big, kind of early 80s, 
we never remarked upon it at all, did we? No. That he definitely belonged to an older generation. Completely. He was seven or eight years old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sting, wasn't he? So what are you saying? Debbie Harry was how old? Debbie Harry is, uh, where is she? 78. She's 78. 78. So, so, Steve, Deb- so Steve Howard was on this list. He's 77, is 70, that right? 76, I think. Right, right. Isn't that fantastic? So do you think we'll see a day? Now, you know, so Bob Dylan and, and, and the like is still kind of on tour uh, at the age of 82. And, you know, when Bob Dylan grew up, I mean, nobody would have been performing that that late in life, you know, and people wouldn't have lived beyond 75 or whatever in those days. But obviously life expectancy is increasing all the time. Is it not likely that Ed Sheeran will still be playing at the age of 100? It's quite possible, isn't it? Wow. Expensive medical care, uh, a, a, a fearsome exercise regimen. He'd his probably life. be in very good nick. He probably really yeah. looks after himself, you know, in, yeah. in a way that earlier generations didn't. Yeah. You know, so, so it will be... You know, the, the, there will be, you know, geezer stock in, in, in the year, uh, you know, in, in, in 40 years' time will we'll be, you know, Taylor Swift, Ed Sheeran, Harry Styles and so forth. We'll all be taking the taking the stage at the age of 95 plus. I think that's going to happen, Alex. Don't I'm you? sure it's going to happen. I shall look forward to Liam Gallagher hobbling on age 92 and wheezing his way through cigarettes and alcohol. <laughs> this is a junction in the word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. Has anybody joined our new Patreon family, Alex? They have. We, Good. We, we've got a, we've got a bunch of new patrons. Whatever the collective noun is for a group of patrons, right. sign up for patrons. Um, I'm going to read their names out now for you. Um, no. I'm going to start with John Williams. John Williams is. Well, I, I can't make a. Oh, I, can, can I make a joke out of John Williams? I don't know if I can. Classical yeah, guitarist, classical wasn't guitar it? player, and, and, and film score composer, <laughs> famous film composer, indeed. And yeah, very, very glad to have such a celebrity on board. <laughs> member of Sky, wasn't it? A group yeah. called Sky, wasn't Sky it? Sky with with two Y's or something spelt weirdly, wasn't it? Oh, I don't know about that. Anyway, carry on. David A. James. David A. James. James. Was there a member of Modern Romance called David James? There was a member of Modern Romance called David James, nice nice bloke, who uh, subsequently did a lot of work with Jar Wobble, who was a guest of ours only the other day on uh, Word Career. uh, He's with his excellent autobiography just come out. Was there also a goalkeeper called David James? There is. There is. Well, he retired, retired goalkeeper called David James. Yes, indeed. Carry on. What okay. who else we got? We've got Jack at the Beach. Jack at the Beach? Yeah. Is that Poss- a bit of a... Possibly not their real name. No, possibly not. We're welcome nonetheless. Jean Laplage. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Laplage. Uh, Matthew Crossley. Matthew Crossley. Excellent. Well, it's, very, it's always nice to... Um, to welcome you on board. <laughs> Matthew Cross is not like a, 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 a Knox County uh, defensive player. Right, okay. Very good. <laughs> the 70s. Because nowadays they're all called Kyle, aren't they? You see that. Yeah. See. <laughs> it, it, anyway, carry on. Stuart Hanscom. Stuart Hanscom. Good. Listen, all these people are immensely welcome. It's really important to us to, to have the support of these people uh, in order to, to maintain the extraordinary level of productivity that we <laughs> we have established. Carry on, anybody else? We indeed. Uh, Alan with a U, Griffiths. Alan with a U? How does yeah. that work? Where does the U go? The U goes between the L and the N. Yeah, oh. otherwise I guess it would well, be Alan. Oh, Alan. Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah, oh, very good. I was thinking of Alan with an extra U. Okay, uh, of, course, right. it, of course, indeed, yes. Um, Andy Gunton. Andy, that's good. Well, Andy Gunton was, as we all know, his bass player with the Skids um, in in about nineteen seventy nine. I wonder what he'd been up to. Carry Ian, on. Ian Marshall Bennett. Ian Marshall Bennett, very good. Double barreled. That's um, you get a special discount if you're double you do. barreled. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, and talking of discounts, the next um, lot are annually subscribed, and if you subscribe annually to our Patreon. 
you get a 15% discount. So, um, Philip Davenport. Philip Davenport. Oh, do you remember, PG Woodhouse no, character. Good bit. Do, do you remember Davenport's, um, Davenport's Beer at Home? Do you remember that, Mark? It used to be advertised on the television. No. <laughs> this is a classic memory of the 50s and 60s where people couldn't afford beer. You, you basically signed up for something called Beer at Home. These come and deliver it to your house, I think, because Davenport's beer at home. Carry on. Sorry, floundering. Carry on. (laughs) Um, Craig Butcher. Craig Butcher. Good to hear from you. Very good. Dev Sherlock. Dev. Dev. What's the show? That's a good word. Dev. Yeah, what's Dev? Dev. Devlin? No, I don't know. Dev. Could be Devlin. Could be Devon. Devon Malcolm. He's fast bowler for England. Carry on. Martin Davison. Martin Davison, good. Glad and, to glad to have you here. And finally, last but not least, is Malcolm. Just, just Malcolm. Malcolm. Just, just plain Malcolm. Malcolm. No sir, no need. No good. They never okay. once. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Malcolm. So what what are the benefits of people being Patreon supporters, Alex, in case anybody's not aware of them? Okie doke. So we have various tiers of membership. And uh, but first of all, if every subscriber have you noticed whenever Alex says tears, Mark, we're doing this on Zoom so we can see each other. Whenever Alex uses the word tears, he goes, tears. <laughs> yeah, he yeah, holds yeah. his hand up like that in a kind of jabbing sideways. Yes. <laughs> to make sure we totally understand yes. <laughs> what's been discussed here. Tears. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yes. Tears. Yes. Yeah. Um, every patron, though, uh, gets a mention on the pod and uh, included in our, our thank you hall of fame on our on our website. But um, the first tier is is the Friday night quiz tier, which grants you access to our weekly Friday night quiz every Friday at six pm, which is doing... very good fun and it heartily is. recommended. Absolutely, absolutely. And the next tier up from that is uh, the the podcast tier, where you get early access, early ad free access, my add to all of our podcast audio content. Um, the next one up from that is our video cast here, where you get early ad-free access to all our video content. So word in your attics, word in your ears, word down your ways, all the all that kind of stuff. Um, and then above that is our clubhouse tier, where you get uh, a special birthday treat. Mark and Dave will digitally come round to your house and rummage through your record collection in your very own word in your ear uh, video cast. Um, and also, you get um, you get an invite to our to our word socials as well. You know? Oh right! Oh yeah! yeah. Up in, in a pub in central London, have, yeah, have yeah. some beer and, and and some great conversation. And I should add also that all patrons um, also get first dibs on any live events that we are putting on. So it's uh, thoroughly worthwhile. Let's be honest. Absolutely, absolutely, it makes absolute sense. Get in there. And stay in there. This podcast was brought to you by The Word. <laughs> <laughs>